Shalom, everyone, and welcome to this special Talking Memory program marking International Holocaust Remembrance Day, the first program out of three events that will take place this week. This program and all the events this week are in partnership with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Israel. My name is Medin Shachar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House and will be your host for today's program. I want to welcome our global audience with a special welcome, as always, to the survivors and their families that are with us today. We want to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. The topic of today's program is being a refugee, the case of Ukraine, then and now. And we are honored to have three speakers today. Dr. Marta Chavrishko from the Institute, the Institute Director of Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center, Jonathan Ornstein, CEO of the JCC in Krakow, and Chuck Fishman, award-winning photographer. This program will run a little longer than our regular program, so please stay with us because each speaker has a special story to tell and together they create a unique and complex tapestry of the refugee experience then and now. And now I would like to invite Igal Cohen, CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, to deliver opening remarks. Igal. Hello everyone and shalom. I moved to open the events marking International Holocaust Remembrance Day with a special lecture, part of our international series, Talking Memory. This week, we will deal with various topics that create the fragile dialogue between the unique status of the Holocaust as a historical event, its universal meaning, and the lessons we must learn. The Holocaust had many faces, genocide, barbaric robbery, humiliation that is behind walls, blind hatred, also forced deportation and migration that was imposed on millions of people. Civilians were uprooted from their homeland and exiled to foreign lands with the feeling of being permanently temporary. The phenomenon of the refugees has not disappeared from the global agenda. These very days, we are faced with a stream of refugees seeking shelter in the heart of Europe, as well as other cases in various parts of the world. Today's refugees relate a narrative of sights, sounds, and smells which we had thought we erased forever. Today, we will deal with another complex story that is not often discussed, the treatment of Jewish women in Ukraine after liberation. Dr. Marta Vrieshko, our guest speaker, has become refugee, recently fleeing Ukraine to Switzerland. It is impossible to accept that she suffers such tragedy today in the 21st century. During the lecture, I would ask us to consider the moral duty we draw from the events of the past and reaffirm our commitment to reach out and help whatever another human being suffers. A thank you to our honored guests who are joining us today from the Friedrich Hebert Foundation, Dr. Paul Pasch and Judith Stelmach, our longtime partners. A special thank you to the lecturers who are sharing their thoughts with us, Dr. Marta Abrieshko, Jonathan Onsten, and Chuck Fishman. Thank you to Medin Shachar, who coordinated this special project. And the last important thank you is to you, the participants from all parts of the world. I wish us a significant and moving event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Igal, for your words. And now I would like to invite Judith Stelmach, who will speak on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. Judith. Um, so actually, I will really start uh, with thanking um, the Ghetto Fighters House and its whole team, and especially Yumudin and Igal and Chava and Shira, uh, for this wonderful and professional and pleasant uh, cooperation uh, that we have uh, the honor and the pleasure to have with you for so many years. 
Um, I would also like to thank uh, our guests tonight, uh, Dr. Mata Avrishko, Jack Fishman, and Jonathan Oristan, for agreeing to join us tonight in this very special event. As I uh, mentioned before, um, this is the first of a, a series of events uh, we will be having this week uh, to uh, commemorate the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, and uh, in the past years, uh, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, that is a German social democratic foundation uh, working all around the world and also in Israel for many years, um, we, we have established uh, a habit, uh, I could say, uh, to work uh, together with the Ghetto Fighters House. Um, on the event of International Holocaust Remembrance Day um, every year and to commer commemorate it uh, with a series of events each year um, that uh, reflect uh, both uh, the uh, memory of the Shoah um, and uh, also the more universal aspects uh, of uh, this terrible event in human history. Uh, we feel that our partnership in this specific context reflects not only our common interest in dealing with the memory of the Shoah and conveying it to as many people in Israel and worldwide as possible, but also meets our common belief that lessons learned from the Shoah should guide us in creating space for humanism and solidarity in the present. This year, we have chosen to deal with the topic of being a refugee then and today, then and now, as unfortunately, this topic is very relevant in today's reality, as Igal has already mentioned. Um, it was relevant during the Shoah, but unfortunately, it continues to be relevant also today. The circumstances have changed, but humans are still inflicting suffering and displacement upon other humans. Um, I looked it up shortly today, today on the internet. Dr. Google tells us many things, and unfortunately, some of the things it tells us are very sad. In 2022, 100 million people worldwide, from the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, to Myanmar to Syria to Venezuela and beyond, have been forcibly displaced. That is a new record. The UN Refugee Agency estimates that among these people, about 2 million need urgent access to resettlement this year. And the war in the Ukraine has brought war, suffering and refugees again into the heart of Europe. So what does this mean? Have we learned nothing from the past? We hope that during the upcoming hour and a bit, we will be able to place our spotlight on what happened in the Ukraine during World War II and what is happening there today. Um, but we would also like to share with you an example of humanism into the, in the darkness uh, that is surrounding us. So I hope that uh, this um, compilation of different aspects of being a refugee and of being a human being uh, will be interesting for all of you, and I thank you for being with us and wish us a very interesting evening. Thank you. And thank you, Judith, again for uh, your comments and your insights. As always, you're always right in there, knowing exactly what we need to do. And this year, I have to say that you were one of the leaders in uh, deciding on what our what our topic would be, and I'm, I'm very proud to be uh, working with you again this year. And we are gonna start. <laughs> Our first speaker is Dr. Marta Khavashko. She is a historian and research associate at the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Also, she is a director of the Institute at the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kiev. She currently is a, is it URIS or URIS fellow at Basel University? Uh, her research interests focus on gender and violence during World War II and the Holocaust, oral history, nationalism, and memory studies. Currently, she is developing her book on sexual violence during the Holocaust in Ukraine, and I couldn't find 
a better uh, person to, to speak with us tonight. So thank you, Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Medin, for your kind introduction. Hello, everyone, and shalom. I am very privileged and honored to be here today. And I would like to speak a little bit about my own experience as a war refugee from Ukraine and about my research about Jewish women and men during and after the Holocaust. So on the eve of 24th February, 2022, I was in my hometown in Lviv, known as Lemberg or Lviv. After putting my nine-year-old son, Danilo, to bed, I started working on my academic article about Jewish women's survival strategies during the Holocaust in Ukraine, yet I couldn't concentrate. I had bad feelings caused by alarming news in different media outlets about the possible Russian aggression against Ukraine. At 4.30 in the morning, I learned that Putin had started his talk. Who would make an address at night? Why? For what reason? There could be only one reason. From the very beginning of Putin's angry speech, I knew what would come out of it. I couldn't hold my tears. War. The big war had started. All my plans about academic and educational projects, including the presentation scheduled for Sunday at Yad Vashem, suddenly lost values. Different was stories from the World War II and the Holocaust came to my mind. Suddenly, I recall the diary of Regina Brudinger, a young Jewish girl stud, uh, uh, who at the beginning of the plan Barbarossa, Operation Ar 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 Bar Barbarossa was studying at Teaching Institute in Lviv. And her study was interrupted brutally at the four at nine o'clock on 24th uh, June of 1941. On the second day, she volunteered as a nurse at a local military hospital. And the whole war, she was a combat medic. Her choice and her courage inspired me. At the same time, I couldn't stop thinking about my family, my son. I went to nearest grocery store to buy some essential food supplies. First of all, bread. While waiting in the line, I suddenly recalled the war dairy of Lviv resident Kazimira Purai, where she described her struggle to get bread on the first day of the German attack on Lviv. I thought of her horror, fear, and grief. Fear for my husband and my mother kills me and keeps me awake. I don't know what to do to save them from death. Confined Katarina in her diary on 2nd July, 1941. When reading her diary, I was trying to imagine her circumstances and her feeling of despair. All of a sudden, I could relate to her story on a very personal level. The fear for my son and husband paralyzed me in the first hours of Russian war on Ukraine. I couldn't have imagined that I would experience feelings, choices, and survival strategies similar to those I studied and wrote about. I couldn't have thought that the horrors of mothers seeking to feed, protect, and save their children's, children during World War II and the Holocaust would become a dark reality of mine and millions of mothers in Ukraine nowadays. For the following 11 year days of my war life in Lviv, I was trying to comfort my son. Concert day and night air alarms force us to seek hiding. In this traumatizing environment, Danilo developed sleeping and eating disorders. He kept asking me who would help Ukrainians to defeat the enemy, how Ukraine will survive. I try my best to calm him down and find some natural remedies to improve his sleep, but to no avail. Day by day, 
The situation with food and medicine supplies in Lviv was getting worse and remains to be precarious even to this day. Nobody knew at that time how deep Russian tanks would penetrate Ukraine territories. Nobody knew what expect Lviv and its inhabitants in the near future. In this atmosphere, on the 11th day of big war, on the 6th March, I made one of my most difficult decisions. With, with a heavy heart, I said goodbye to my beloved ones in Lviv, including my parents, both sisters and, and their newborn babies, and also goodbye to our relatives from Kyiv who were hiding from Russian bombs in our home in Lviv at the time. I hope that they will survive this cruel and unjustified war and our family will re uh, reunite in the future and we will celebrate all family holidays together. While the decision to flee my home country was devastating, I believe it was necessary for the sake of my son. I wish I could have saved all Ukrainian children from the horrors of war and protect their childhood. I dream of a world where no child would experience war, lose their beloved ones, or have their homes taken away. Our way to the safety was possible due to the help of numbers of my dear friends and colleagues, most of them Holocaust scholars, including Natalia Alexon and Camille Kiek. I hope that some of you maybe know them. They arranged the car for me and my son to the Polish border. Due to the long car line near it, we took our baggage and walked further on foot for almost three kilometers. Then we waited in the open air for almost three and a half hours. And here you see this picture that I took at this day with this line of people. The kind people provided us with tin uh, blank blankets, but we were still frozen. We were surrounded mostly by other women and children of all ages with their pets or without some of them were trying to make jokes. Some made quarrels with those who didn't want to wait in line and try to pass the border as soon as possible. After several additional hours, hours on the border with warm food, hot tea and candies for children, brave and determined woman Susanna, whom I've met for the first time in my life, took us to Warsaw by her car. Danilo had a fever and other issues manifesting his mental and physical health, health condition in the next day. He was thirsty for hugs and kisses. On 15 March, we reach Hamburg, where I get an emergency scholarship from Hamburg Institute for Social Research. Then we, we moved to Basel. Due to the generous support of Yuri's program, I can foster my research on the Holocaust here. I, uh, in contrast to many Ukrainian scholars who were forced to stay in Ukraine or even under Russian occupation, I can live without fear of being killed by Russian missiles, which now are hitting residential buildings in Ukraine. I can live without fear of being kidnapped and tortured by Russian soldiers, in contrast to many of my friends and acquaintances who are in Russian captivity now. I can have heating, electricity, hot tea, whenever I want, in contrast to Ukraine people who suffer from Russian attacks on critical infrastructure in Ukraine nowadays. And this privileged position, I used to foster my research about the sexual violence during the Holocaust in Ukraine. Today, I will present some findings of my research. Um, maybe you know some research about the, this topic in general, about sexual victimization, pri primarily Jewish women and girls during the Holocaust. Many um, outstanding scholars wrote a lot about sexual, um, um, sexual misbehavior of 
German soldier, soldiers, of Hungarian soldiers, Romanian soldiers. My aim is to bring to the life sexually violent behavior of local men, those who were classmates, friends, beloved ones even sometimes, those who were acquaintance of Jewish women and girls, and those who during the Holocaust turned into violent perpetrators, and those who were still live next door during to, uh, uh, to their victims uh, after the Holocaust. So today I will present findings about another war after the war that Jewish people who survived the Holocaust had when they were seeking for justice, when they were trying to hold accountable their perpetrators, well known to them even before the war. And my research nowadays gain its additional value because as we know today, people in Ukraine, first of all, women and girls, men and boys are suffering different types of sexual violence. Some of them are very similar to those suffered by Jewish women and men during the Holocaust. I mean, gun rape, public rape, sexual slavery, and others. My presentation focuses on post-war crimes trials in Soviet Ukraine that addresses the question of sexual violence against Jewish women and girls during the Holocaust, based on documents from former KGB archive related to military tribunals against local collaborators, my presentation will analyze narrative strategies, first of all, of victims themselves, I mean those who survived rape and other forms of sexual violence during the Holocaust in Ukraine. Pre-trial investigation was conducted by secret police, NKVD and NKGB, renamed into MVD and MGB in 1946, and members of Smirsh. Two types of court, special military court, and, uh, where, uh, and the Court of Frontline Division and War Tribunals in Division Corps, Armies, Army Groups, and NKVD were set at that time. The entire military judicial system was headed by the Supreme Court of USSR. Between 1943 and 1953, um, more than 90,000 of people were held accountable for their wrongdoings from the point of view of Soviet authorities at that time. Many of them were Nazi collaborators and their helper, helpers. The large-scale persecution of war criminals in the USSR started in 1943 with public trials against Germans and their Ukraine and Russian accomplices in Krasnodar, Kharkiv, and other cities. The legal framework for this outlined is so-called April Decree, issued on 19th April 1943, by the Supreme Soviet, uh, by, by the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. It identified types of punishment for various war crimes and clarified the definition of such notions as traitors and accomplices, izmenniki rodiny i pasubniki. There was no specific mention of sexual violence as a war crime or crime against humanity in these documents, but it could hypothetically be classified as violence against the population, насилие над населением, a very broad category. This attests to the fact that sexual crimes during the war were underestimated and thus Soviet authorities had little interest in investigating them specifically. In this regard, I want to stress that, as you know, during Nuremberg tribunals, um, nobody was charged with sexual uh, crimes and sexual um, um, violence allegation, despite the fact that some testimonies contain the facts and information about different types of sexual violence committed by Nazis, their allies, and local helpers in Nazi-occupied territories.
In general, Soviet uh, authorities were uh, show no interest in persecution their own people because uh, it could bring to the line uh, sexual crimes committed by Red Army in occupied territory of Germany, especially in Berlin. We know that approximately uh, more than um, one, uh, more than um, uh, one hundred thousand German women in Berlin were um, raped by Red Army soldiers, and approximately ten thousand of them committed suicide. So, um, any agents during uh, this post-war justice system was um, show showed no interest in. Um, in persecuting sexual crimes, including Soviet, uh, Soviet authorities. In general, Soviet investigators were not interested and um, uh, they were more concentrated in other crimes connected to robbery, connected to beating, to, um, to guarding ghettos and camps, for example, or guarding the killing sites or killing perpetrated by Germans and their uh, allies. But uh, some of um, KGB files, some of criminal cases contain a lot of material uh, about different sex crimes. In general, in most cases, those testimonies were given by Holocaust survivors themselves, by non-Jewish people who were, for example, in prison with Jewish women, girls, men and boys at that time. For example, in this slide, you see how one of the communists actually gave his testimony to Soviet authorities about Rosa Feldman, a Jewish girl of 15 year old. And she, uh, he told your, uh, he told to Soviet authorities that she was often taken from the cell. And after she returned, she would tell me that policemen raped her. In many ways, in many uh, examples, we see that Holo Holocaust survivors approached NKVD and insisted on um, giving testimony about sex sexual crimes in different ghettos and camps. For example, Volodymyr Pekelis was one of the key witnesses uh, who described the sexual crimes and gun rapes and repeated rapes uh, of Jewish women in the forced labor camp Lysahora near Berdichev. He told to Soviet investigators, after 10 in the evening, drunk policemen would go to them, meaning Jewish girls, who were separated from Jewish men, and rape them. During the day, those women came to us, meaning Jewish men, to get warm because it was cold in their barrack, and told that men um, uh, did to them. And some of women, Voldemar Pekelis told, that some of women express um, express the feeling that they want to take their lives and just to stop these sufferings. In some cases, we have testimonies of female Holocaust survivors who were talking about the sexual victimization of those Jewish girls uh, that um, that were with them in some ghettos, like in Kamyonets Pudilsky ghetto. During Soviet investigation, Clara gave her testimony about forced prostitution in this ghetto. She told that many hungry Jewish women agreed to have sex with local Ukraine policeman Tchaikovsky in order to, uh, to be allowed to go to market and get some food. And she told during this investigation, there were many such cases. And he, Tchaikovsky, raped ghetto inhibitants, Tanya, Hanka, Basia, Donia, and many, many others. And they would later come to me and my mother, cry and tell us about what happened to them. Among rape survivors, not everyone was probably willing to testify about sexual violence for various reasons, including feel of shame, guilt, fear of condemnation and distrust. The very circumstances of the procedure may have constituted an obstacle for women 
as they were reluctant to see their rapist or identify them in a photo. Tell the story multiple times, which may have triggered re-traumatization. In addition, the vast majority of investigators, as well as prosecutors and judges, were men. It is likely that some women found it uncomfortable or even shameful to discuss sexuality with men. Another reason that could have influenced women's decision to testify about sexual violence or to keep it in secret was the possible publicity of the trials. This was exactly the case with the trial against Dmitro Zhuk. And here you see the local Ukraine newspaper, Chernomorska Komuna, Black Sea Commune, about the head of the local police in Vradivka, Dmitro Zhuk. Um, and um, uh, in this article, uh, this article include the full names of three rape victims, including one survivor, only one survivor, Halina Yusim. The available materials do not allow us to, uh, to designate whether Halina permitted this publication of her name, whether she had any opportunity to influence this at all. However, it can be assumed that this article may have had some impact on other survivors of rape. On the one hand, it may have deterred those who fear it, feared the disclosure of their identity. On the other hand, it could encourage some women to seek justice in court and public acknowledgement of their suffering. Some women wanted their husbands to be unaware of what happened to them during the war in terms of their sexual integrity and autonomy. This was the case of Anna from Genichesk. During the war, she hid her Jewish identity. But the chief of the local auxiliary police, Falkenstern, you see him on this photo, was suspicious and constantly summoned her for interrogation to the prison, despite the fact that Anna had a little child at the time. After numerous beatings and death threats, he raped her during one of these interrogations. At the beginning of the Soviet investigation, Anna didn't explicitly mention rape and used the general word humiliation. But during one of the interrogations, she said, I asked the investigation authority and, ju and the judiciary not to disclose what I will, will say next. At the end of the harassment, no matter how much I resisted, Falkenstern raped me. By these words, Anna wanted to underline that she doesn't will to disclose information to the public and her relatives, including her husband. From the interrogation protocol of her husband, it's clear that she didn't tell him the, uh, the whole story. He didn't know about the rape in general. It must be noted that her wish influenced the verdict a lot, which didn't mention rape. While working with many um, testimonies and diaries of Holocaust survivors, I noticed that Anna was not alone in her fear to disclose this information to their beloved ones. I learned from some Holocaust testimonies that some men, after learning what happened to their, to their wives during the Holocaust, divorced them, they left them, and it could be one of the reasons behind the silence of some rape survivors. An important characteristic of, of rape victims' testimony was the emphasis on the demonstrative nature of certain sex crimes. It was important for women to emphasize that rapes during the war often took place not as private acts, but as public acts with spectators, relatives, friends, acquaintances, fellow victims, and non-Jewish neighbors. 
The victim's emphasis on the presence of witnesses during the rape may have stemmed not only from their pragmatic intention to help the investigation find additional evidence of the perpetrator's guilt, such as other people's testimony. It may also attest to a major psychological trauma following the public act of sexual humiliation. On the one hand, the, pre the presence of other persons during rape was a source of additional shame for victims. It intimidated women who witnessed the act of, and humiliated the men, showing them that they are unable to protect their women. It undermined their masculinity and their manhood. In these circumstances, show this public rape, this demonstrative rape, was also a, as a means of communication between different men. And those perpetrators were trying to establish and exercise their power and send message to their enemy men, to Jewish men, you are weak, you can't protect not yourself, not your women. Um, and... Uh, in, in this case, it's very, it's very important that those women were willing to break silence, raise their voices and became a voices of those who were silenced by death. In this case, case of Ney Leban, it was agricultural Jewish colony near Krivoyrik in Dnipropetrovska Oblast. And uh, this uh, case was about the group of local perpetrators, and it consists of local policemen, the local mayor, and the relatives of those perpetrators and their friends. They made this gang, the, this group of perpetrators, and they enter Jewish homes. They beat people, they loot their property, and in many cases, they raped um, they raped local inhabitants, local Jewish women in the presence of their family members and their neighbors. And here you see in this slide, uh, um, um, one of the perpetrator, he was one from 15, approximately 15 perpetrators who acknowledged his guilt and the guilt of other uh, uh, of other per perpetrators. All of them denied the rape allegations, despite the fact that four Jewish survivors, most of them were young Jewish girl, young Jewish women, um, in details described what happened to them and what happened to other Jewish women who were um, at the beginning of 1942 killed by Nazis and their local helpers in Krivy Rih. And here you see uh, basically the co a quote from, uh, from Celia Rosenberg, from the testimony of Celia Rosenberg. And during her interrogation, she said, after beating my mother, Shevchenko, one of the perpetrators, made us all go into the hallway from the apartment. And this time he left me with a six-month-old baby in my arms, whom Shevchenko ordered to give to somebody in the apartment, or he would, ki uh, he would kill it. Because of Shevchenko's threats, I gave the child to my mother, she said. After that, Shevchenko tormented me, threatened to stab me to death, beat me, and then rape me. Sometimes the rapes described by women during the Soviet investigations had a sort of transactional nature when women received a certain benefits from their rapists for the sexual service, such as an opportunity to avoid arrest, to escape, to save their lives. However, while describing these situations to investigators, women try to prove violent nature of these acts. To illustrate th this, uh, women made sure to emphasize the imbalance of power between themselves and the perpetrators, their extreme vulnerability in that moment when the sexual acts took place, and their inability to put up resistance. Among other things, they cited having been threatened with murder or uh, 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 or with disclosure to German authority. 
Here you see on this slide the testimony provided by 23-year-old Zhenya Bromberg. And uh, it's especially typical in this regard. Being questioned on June 1944 by Soviet authorities, she said that in August 1942 in the village of Cernike in Rivne Oblast, it's a Volyn region in the north part of Ukraine, she would caught by policeman Kirill Fedorov, who started leading her towards the police station. The girl tried to bribe him. Fedorov did take her man's shirt, but he demanded sexual service in addition. Zhenya pointed out, I quote, He offered me, offered, if you don't have sex with me, I'll kill you. Fearing that Fedorov would shoot me right away, I was forced to have sex with him. After Fedorov used me, he took me to police officer Polyukhovich's apartment. Zhenya phrasing used reflects her perception of the genocidal circumstances and the dynamic of power between the local Nazi accomplices and Jewish women generated by these circumstances. In this situation, police officers had every opportunity to abuse their power and establish their authority over Jewish women through sexual violence. Not all testimonies of Holocaust survivors were taken with seriousness and responsibility. On January 8, 1954, Raisa told her story in front of a military tribunal in Odessa. Her testimony was the last attempt to pursue the Soviet courts that Hrabovsky, here you see his picture, he was arrested, several months before the trial, was a rapist. Basically, Hrabovsky was her classmate. He very well knew him before the war. During the trial, she emphasized that she was 13 years old and she was a virgin at the time of the assault. Also, the questions put to Raisa were not included in the court records. We can guess what they were from her answers. Why did she not call for, her, for help? Why did her parents not notice any signs of violence on her body? Why did she keep silent about the rape until the state investigation? As you can see from the slide, Raisa answers reveal that she was defensive. From the available documents, it looks that those involved in legal process held some rape myth about proper behavior of rape victims, in particular, that they must scream and actively resist rather than freeze with horror. But Raisa had to keep silent during her humiliation. If she had screamed, she would have been exposed and sent back to the convoy. Um, judges and prosecutors were suspicious about Raisa's story because they pro probably assumed that victims of sexual violence could not keep silent for a long time and were compelled to take their, uh, their perpetrators to court and to punish them. The prosecutor said in his closing speech that Hrabovsky guilt in Raisa raping has not been proven as evidence given by Raisa was contradictory and the circumstances under which rape was committed caused doubt. Hrabovsky was sentenced to 10 years in a correctional camp in, um, as a betrayer of the nation, but the verdict did not contain any reference to the rape of Raisa, despite the fact that she insisted that she was raped by Rabovsky, that he abused his power as a policeman while guarding her and other Jews. And he, um, instead of saving her, he uh, um, committed a crime, sex crimes, a sex crime. So the long-term impacts of rape and the secondary traumatization of the rape survivors, survivors 
So show the case of Clara. And here you can see her on the slide. This is the place where her family members, her Jewish neighbors were killed by Nazis and local helpers, Nazi helpers on the outskirts of bar in Vinnytska, uh, in Vinnytska Oblast in October 1941. For a long time after the war, Clara was one of the main witnesses in the case of Rehori Andrusil. And here you see him during the show trial in 1966, and you see the great crowd, the big audience outside the, the, um, uh, the place where trial was held. And uh, on the other side, you see him uh, on this uh, killing side, basically. Uh, at that time, uh, Rehuri Andrusi uh, was a chief of local police and he was accomplices. He was perpetrator and he was a facilitator of mass killing of Jewish people. Soviet authorities arrested him only in 1965 in Romania. Uh, at that time, KGB officers brought him to the killing site, as, as you see, and uh, they um, held investigation. And here you see the quote from uh, Clara's testimony. She recalled that during uh, this killing process, she and other 15 Jewish girls were forced to get dressed they were brought to the building of the police in the center of uh, the, uh, in the center of bar and raped by germans during the so-called celebration after mass killing they were raped by germans and local helpers during night andrusiev raped clara and she was the only one who survived this cruel night those traumatic events had a tremendous effect on Clara in the following months and years. According to her sister, Esa, Clara was unable to speak at all for a bit. As a young 15-year-old girl, she lost her 12 teeth and she started stammering. The investigation process that started more than 20 years after those horrific events had a major impact on her state of mind. The Vinnytsia Psychological Facility report on Clara reads as follows. When she talks about her experience, she gets nervous, shaking all, shaking all over, stammering and crying. She complains of sleep disorder and nightmares. I hope that stories of those brave women who broke the silence about their victim sexual victimization during the Holocaust will inspire women and men in Ukraine who now are experiencing sexual violence in hands of Russian military. I hope that bravery of Jewish survivors, Holocaust survivors who fought for justice will inspire Ukraine survivors of sexual violence in their fight for justice. As of June, as the beginning of June, the United Nations had received more than 100 reports about sexual violence, including 19 men and seven boys. I want to stress that the youngest survivor of sexual violence in Ukraine uh, 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 nowadays is only four year old and the oldest one is 82 year old. Prosecutor General, the Office of Prosecutor General in Ukraine reported about more than 150 cases of sexual violence by Russian soldiers. Recently, the first rape trial in Ukraine was held in Chernihiv. One of the Russian soldiers, Ruslan Kuliev, a 30-year-old man, was charged with attempted rape of 16-year-old girl in Chernihiv Oblast. He threatened to kill her brother if she didn't have sex with him. Many other uh, survivors of sexual violence today are seeking justice, and they need our help and support. Thank you so much for your um, for your attention, and I would be happy to uh, respond to all your questions. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much uh, for your uh, presentation. Um, we knew it was going to be a very difficult topic and you can see in the chat that uh, people are beginning to discuss uh, what happened to women and also men uh, during the Holocaust and then having to deal with it afterwards. And we can't help but think about what's happening today. And uh, your last slide just reflects that, that uh, women and children are in danger today and we need to be aware of that. And uh, looking back at our history and what happened during the Holocaust, maybe it can help us to help in the future. So thank you for that. And um, I have to say that that's one of the reasons why I turned to uh, Jonathan Ornstein, who's gonna be our next presenter. Uh, our next presenter, like I said, is uh, the CEO of the JCC, Youth Community Center in Krakow. And since it's opening in 2008 by the Prince of Wales, that is now King Charles, uh, Jonathan has served as the Chief Executive Officer of the Jewish Community Center of Krakow, Poland, an organization devoted to rebuilding Jewish life in Krakow. The JCC boasts over 750 Jewish members, welcomes 10,000 visitors a month, and has become one of Poland's most visible signs of Jewish revival. Uh, Jonathan has created the Ride for the Living and Holocaust Survivor Day, two global initiatives with tens of thousands of participants. Prior to the JCC's opening in 2008, he lectured in modern Hebrew at Krakow's uh, Jagiellonian University Department of Jewish Studies for six years and founded the Gesher Association for Polish-Israeli Dialogue. A native of New York City, Jonathan moved to Israel in 1994, living for seven years on a kibbutz in the Negev Desert and served in a combat unit in the IDF before moving to Poland in 2001. He is a founding member of the Krakow Association of Christians and Jews, where he serves as vice president. He also serves on the boards of the Krakow branch of the Child Survivors of the Holocaust organization, Hillel Poland, JCC Global, and the Abraham Global Peace Initiative. Jonathan, a primary architect of, the, of Poland's contemporary Jewish rebirth, is a frequent international speaker and media contributor on issues relating to Jewish Poland and an activist for Holocaust survivors. And for that reason, uh, Jonathan uh, was not able to be with us this evening or today for the program. So he and I sat down for a virtual conversation last week about his work at the JCC and the extraordinary humanitarian initiative to help Ukrainian refugees that arrive in Krakow every day since Russia invaded Ukraine last February. So let's listen to our talk. So. Shalom, welcome, uh, Jonathan, the CEO of the JCC in Krakow. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for being a part of this program. I think we all are interested in learning a little bit about the JCC Krakow. Before we talk about the work you're doing now with Ukrainian refugees, to hear a little bit about your work in general and how the JCC Krakow started and how you got there as well. Sure. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be with you here uh, today. Um, the JCC was founded in 2008 by King Charles, now King Charles, who had visited Krakow a few years earlier, met with some Holocaust survivors as part of his official visit to the city, was very moved and wanted to help them. And the idea they came up with was a senior citizen center. He went back to London, got involved with an organization called World Jewish Relief, and they did a little research and they realized it wasn't only this Holocaust community, Holocaust survivor community in Krakow, that there were young people with Jewish roots who were also finding out about their background. And they thought instead of doing something to only serve this survivor community, they could do a bigger project and hopefully reach out and become a hub and, and draw out some of these Jews that were finding out, these Poles that were finding out about their Jewish identity. And uh, then Prince Charles, now King Charles said okay and got involved and they were able to raise the money for the project. And then he and Camilla came to Krakow and opened our building in 2008. So we've been open for almost 15 years. Um, I've been the, the, the director, CEO, director from the beginning. I was living here before in Krakow, actually. I uh, essentially took a year off uh, from my uh, law studies in the U.S., Found made my way to Israel, found my way to a kibbutz, fell in love with the kibbutz, uh, was a uh, you know, lone soldier and deciding what to do after the army. And I met a Polish woman, uh, fell in love, sight unseen, I moved to Poland. It didn't work out with her, but I just fell in love with Krakow and I stayed and I've been living in Krakow for 
over 20 years. So I happened to be here when they were building the JCC and I applied for the job and there you go. That's so interesting. It sounds so much like my story. Um, so actually you in, in in Poland or in Krakow from 2001, did you also meet people from the Jewish community, the younger people or survivors? Were you meeting absolutely. them just on your daily life in Krakow? Yes, absolutely. So I was teaching Hebrew to the younger people and I was teaching English to the survivors. So I already started to meet you know, I was part of the community and, and and got to, you know, got to participate in community activities, which there weren't that much, uh, many of, but there was communal life. And then this project uh, was, was beginning to open a building dedicated to rebuilding Jewish life in Krakow. And I, I, I you know, became the director and uh, yeah, for 15 years, that's what we've been doing. So, you know, if you Google how many Jews are in Krakow, I think right. it says there are 100 Jews and we have at this point about 850 Jewish members with a preschool and Sunday school and uh, BBYO and Hillel and Holocaust survivors were taken care of and Shabbat dinners and Hebrew classes and Yiddish and a newspaper and dozens and dozens of programs going on every week and just hundreds of activities a year and really focused on taking care of our survivors, which was the original reason we were built. And then, right. of course, our larger mission to help rebuild the Jewish life in a community that's seen a lot of suffering and is uh, is an hour's drive from Auschwitz. Yeah, yeah. that It's incredible because I think what you just said, Jews finding out that they're Jewish, that's something that we talk about all the time. Uh, this discovery after many years, after the second generation, even sometimes third generation, and to know that they have a place where they can go uh is incredible and it it really felt filled in a void in within the community right so that's incredible Absolutely. so it, the story yeah. of my wife i just wanted to say the story yeah. i said i'm a woman and i moved here and we broke up but there's a happy ending because uh, i met my wife here at the jcc after she found out that she was jewish and she came to a hanukkah party and we have uh and we got married and uh, the chupa was in the courtyard in front of the building and we have we have a, a almost one year old baby now, so an adorable nice. baby. Anyone who wants to see uh, <laughs> Jonathan's life in Krakow can go on his Facebook page. I, I think that uh, the program is focusing on uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees today. Of course, we are also talking about what happened in Ukraine during the Holocaust, but we're also putting uh, focus on what's happening today. And I want you to tell me how. Uh, a JCC that is trying to build up the Jewish community gets involved with Ukrainian refugees that aren't necessarily Jewish. How did this all start? Uh, when, the, when the war started on, in the end of February, we decided that we wanted to do all we could for Ukraine. Um, and we decided that we wanted to do all we could for all Ukrainian refugees, not only for Jews. And we were going to treat Jews and non-Jews equally. And what what was a you know a small food pantry in the in, in the ground floor of the building has grown and grown into uh, you know over a dozen programs that were helping about a thousand people a day, housing four hundred, feeding five hundred, psychological support, uh, language classes, job training, daycare, just a full full spectrum of humanitarian aid. Uh, and we've been able we've been we've been very lucky that the world has has enabled us to help. Uh, over 180,000, almost 200,000 Ukrainian refugees so far, 98% of whom are not Jewish. Um, and we were very much guided by the idea of our normal life. What were our normal work here for the last 15 years is rebuilding Jewish life after the Holocaust. But why are we doing that? You know, why was our community that 90% of our community, 90% of Polish Jewry murdered? Um, you know, I, my feeling is that the 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 Nazis were able to do what they did, um, not only because of their you know organizational skills and the tal the charisma of Hitler and the opportunity of war and the chaos that it brings, but because of indifference. I, I think that the Holocaust was at the scale it was because the world turned away. And 80 years later, when we have a different crisis happening in this exact same part of the world, mm -hmm. and we, the Jews, who have been forsaken by others in this part of the world, I think we have a particular responsibility uh, to 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 help the other uh, because we were because we were left to our own devices. We must not leave them, and that's been really our our guiding principle since since day one. 
And I think it's also uh, what we were trying to talk about, what we would call your presentation, because originally we were supposed to meet online live, was Tikkun Olam, right? Survivors helping survivors. And who else can better understand the, 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 the trauma and the difficulty of being a refugee than uh, Holocaust survivors that are in the community? And it's the survivors themselves that are involved with the refugees. Are they there helping and talking and... Absolutely. Absolutely. We have uh, survivors uh, and other senior citizens volunteering uh, their time, helping us with our program of, you know, we buy lots of bulk food in bulk and we break it down. And, and we, you know, we have a whole active international volunteer program here, along with local volunteers. It's become, you know, a massive, real humanitarian machine. We've more than doubled in size since February. We had 35 full-time employees when this all before the war started, mm -hmm. and we have about 75 full-time employees now with uh, with that new then you know that increase focused on Ukraine. So we have volunteers, among them survivors, uh, you know, from and then people coming from all over the world who are focused on that. You know, there's one thing that really sticks out, and people ask me sometimes, oh, but what about the Holocaust and Ukrainian role and stuff? You know, I walk in two things, two things I would say to that are or that I do say are, one is I walk into work every morning and there are already a line of about 40, usually 30, 40, 50 women, older women, sometimes younger with baby carriages, strollers, waiting in front of the gate before we open. And I have to kind of squeeze by, excuse me, and, and walk and thread my way through this line to go in to work every day. And I'm not walking, you know, I'm walking past human beings. The fact of what, you know, where their grandparents were or where they were, 80 years ago, you know, most almost none of them were alive, uh, you know, and, and and what kind of culpability they might have as a society is to me, it couldn't be more irrelevant. These are human beings before anything else. And we're human beings before anything else. And there are human beings in need and we should we should we have a responsibility to help them and a particular responsibility because we know what it's like not to be helped. Um, but in terms of the survivors, you know, there's a, a story that that uh, that uh, uh, that is just always at the front of my front of my mind when I'm thinking about uh, what we're doing with Ukraine, which is we have an organization, the International Child Survivor of the Holocaust, has a Krakow branch, and they have their monthly meetings on Saturday, at, last Saturday of every month at the JCC, uh, in the Senior Club. We have a dedicated uh, space for Holocaust survivors in the building. And right across from the senior club, when you walk in our building, is the place that we've, uh, we usually had Shabbat dinners, we used to have all different events, and we've now turned that into a free pantry with about 500 people a day coming in seven days a week to get food, clothing, diapers, whatever whatever they need. And we had a meeting in, the, in March. And during the meeting, which is just, again, you see people, as we're having this meeting, the door is open, and you can see these women and children constantly coming in to, to, to take whatever they need. And one of the survivors stood up and said, look across the hall, look what's going on over there. This was us. And she said, I I think we should uh, take our annual dues this year and donate our annual, all of our annual dues to support Ukraine. And one by one, these <laughs> in their 80s, even 90s, one by one, unanimously voted to support uh, support Ukraine and to donate their, their annual dues, which they then promptly did. Uh, so our community is united from survivors down to the little children who are, you know, embrace the Ukrainian children that have come into the preschool. Our community is united and feels that this is the proper response to do not what's comfortable, not what is enough to do, but to do all we can do to help Ukraine. That's incredible. And I think the message is very, very clear. I think also in Judaism, this concept of tikkun olam is what uh, guides, should be guiding us uh, in many situations, especially now. And I agree exactly with what you're saying. I think that the idea that uh, Ukrainians today should be responsible, culpable for what happened uh, 80 years ago is uh, not appropriate. And they are humans more than anything. We are all B'nai Adam. Um, one question you said about 180,000 people or refugees have gone through the JCC, but where do they go afterwards? So not, uh, all... we've, we've helped about 180,000, even probably now it's probably closer, almost uh, 190 or so. Um, some of them come through the building, but we've helped, you know, we were running programs in the beginning of the war. We set up tents on the Ukrainian side of the border with medical mm -hmm. care and food. We were helping people there. We were sending supplies into Ukraine, uh, deep into Ukraine. We're working to with different organizations, with an evangelical Christian organization, actually, who's been operating mm -hmm. 
Ukraine for a long time to send uh, supplies into the neediest places where 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 they're not getting where they, where they don't have access to what they need. So it's not everybody through the building, but housing is a big part of it. You know, we started out feeding people and we realized, wait, we're we're feeding people. That's great, but where are they going? You know, if they're taking the food and a baby and going to sit in the cold and last was the last February, last March, then then we're not doing all we can. So we started to try to house them and we've rented hotel rooms. Um, over over the course has been you know over usually in any any given night it's 100 to 150 hotel rooms um we have apartments that were that we have we rented a we have a, a facility outside of Krakow and underused the palace where we have 80 Ukrainians living so we're we're housing them is a big part of it it's certainly for us the biggest cost and it's the most complicated logistically to be able to house people you can't just throw people in an apartment or in a hotel you have to take care of them and most of the people that we're housing in the hotels and apartments in Krakow have special needs we have people that are blind we have Holocaust survivors from Ukraine, four of them that we're housing. We have, uh, you know, people with, uh, with 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 children with autism, and 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 you know, families with five children. You know, the thing, people in difficult situations, and we we have to continue to to you know to do what we're doing as long as we can do it. Wonderful. I'm I'm trying to take everything in. Uh, it really is uh, an incredible endeavor. Um, I, I don't know how, what to say. It really is uh, something that we can all learn from and uh, to, to really be proud as the Jewish people that we have this uh, understanding of helping uh, others. Um, and, and, and really, it, it, we don't see an end in the near future either. So it's going to be a, a continuous uh, endeavor. I do want to see... If uh, to finish up our uh, talk together, if there's any specific uh, event or situation or story that you have over the past year that sticks out in in your mind uh, during this experience of taking in the the refugees, the Ukrainian refugees. Um, well, the, well, the the story of the Holocaust survivors voting uh, to to give their support is one. Um, it's another one. There was in the the early days of the war. There was a, a Ukrainian refugee named Anna came here with her children. The very first day, I think she was here. She had a friend in Krakow, so she came to Krakow. That's a, a friend from high school who was Jewish, who was a member of the JCC. Anna was Anna is not Jewish, but came to to Krakow, invited by this friend, and actually came to Shabbat dinner. So the mm. war started on a Thursday and she came to Shabbat dinner on Friday, not Jewish, just joined the community. And we helped her out with the, with the, we gave her some support in the beginning. And then she got on her feet and, and was able to, to, you know, to take care of herself and her family. Um, but she stayed in touch with us and we helped her out here and there. And she told me once she came to the office or, uh, you know, after, after going back home to Kiev and visiting her family, her father has special needs and couldn't leave mm. and she has grandparents there. And she told me she was visiting her grandparent, her, visiting with her family, and brought them some supplies. And you know, was telling them that she came to Krakow and she got help from this Jewish community center, from a Jewish organization. Uh, and her mother said, her grandmother said, "Oh, you know why that is? Uh, well, actually, during the war, we hid a Jewish family for two years and 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 took care of them, uh, which she'd never just felt the need to mention. And just because it came up organically, uh, it did. And she By said, the way. <laughs> this is, by the way, right? So this is, and this is why this is the way that the world works, and you know, you the world works and things go in full circle. So now the Jews are helping you. So you know, you never know. Yeah. Things are just very strange, and and you know, you don't you don't do good deeds because they will get paid back. You do good things because they're the right thing to do. But there's always nice when there's a bit of cosmic, you know. Yeah. Symmetry symmetry to these things and 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 we can sort of see see maybe a certain balance in a world that can look very unfair and very and very out of balance right um there's a story that i remember uh that you posted around uh yom kippur and um there was a dilemma do we close for yom kippur because every jew around the world is supposed to be fasting praying everything all the businesses are closed we feel this in israel as well and do we open the gates because the Ukrainian refugees, they don't stop <laughs> needing uh, because we have a holiday. And I think in the end you decided to open, right? Yeah. That was, uh, and 
Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a complicated decision, just because I'm mindful of, you know, we have a, we're a Jewish institution, we have people that support us, we, you know, I have to think only, I can't just make decisions based on what I think is right all the time, although a little bit, a little bit, I seem to do it. Um, you know, to me, there's no question that the highest value in Judaism is life. Kiddusha right? Is life, right? Pikuach Nefesh, this idea okay. that, you know, and people talk about memory and history and all of this. You're not allowed, an observant Jew is not allowed to go to, a, you know, get in his car and drive to a lecture about history or a lecture about the Holocaust or anything on, you know, or a funeral, if that was happening on Shabbat, non-Jewish, it would have to be, you know, we, we think it's memory and history and memory and memory. It's not the case. It's, it's, it's life. So this, the, to me, the, the, you know, the, this idea of, well, we have to help them. You have hungry women and children who don't have another place to go on Yom Kippur. So we didn't have any Jews working. It was non-Jews that would, that, that staffed the center, the thing, but the gate was open and we, we kept, we stayed open that day, and I'm I'm very happy with that decision. Yeah, it really touched me because I think that's also a part of what Judaism is. It's that flexibility, and again, to remember this kiddusha shem, the kiddusha chaim, and we also know from the history of the Holocaust that even the rabbi said kiddusha chaim uh, to bless the life over the shem. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much for uh, talking with us and sharing with us the experiences of JCC Krakow. I wanna remind everyone, and um, I know this is, we're in a recorded interview, but uh, I will be putting in our uh, chat box a link if you want to help in any way to donate, to donate time, to donate money. Uh, I will put a link for, for that in our chat box. And um, I'm sure people will be very interested in, uh, in helping. And continue doing what you're doing. I'm going to continue to follow your work over uh, Facebook, at least. And um, hopefully, hopefully, I'll be in Krakow sometime at some point, and I will make a point to come finally to the JCC and see the amazing work that you're doing. Toda raba raba. You're always welcome. We'd love to see you. And uh, please, if you're coming to Krakow from wherever, please come and uh, come and stop by and visit us. It really uh, was incredible speaking with Jonathan, uh, squeezing a little time to talk with him. Our last speaker today is connected to what is happening in Krakow today and connected to what is happening uh, with Ukrainian refugees. And I've been following him. I feel like a stalker all of a sudden, but I've been following his work as well for a few years. And I was uh, so happy to have this opportunity uh, to have him speak with us about his experience from his perspective, from his uh, uh, understanding of what is happening. So I just want to give you a quick introduction to uh, our final guest today, Chuck Fishman. In his 45-year career, freelance photographer Chuck Fishman has focused on social and political issues with a strong humanistic concern. His work has been extensively published, exhibited, and collected worldwide, and has earned him prestigious World Press Photo Foundation medals four times. His photographs have appeared on the covers of Time, Life, Fortune, Newsweek, the London Sunday Times, The Economist, and numerous others. Chuck's work is included in the collections of the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, the United Nations, Pauline, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, the Stanford University and New York Public Libraries, and Hogan Jazz Archive, Tulane University, to name a few, just a few, as well as private and corporate collections. Chuck's work on Jewish life in Poland began in 1975 and continues to this present day. His first book, Polish Jews, The Final Chapter, was published in 1977. His second book on this subject, titled 1975-2018, A Portrait of Polish Jews, was published in 2019 and accompanied his exhibition, Regeneration, Jewish Life in Poland. First held at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, then at the Galicia Jewish Museum in Krakow before being shown in the United States. And with that, Chuck, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Medine. Thank you for hosting me. Uh, thank you, Ghetto Fighters House. Thank you for allowing me to share my work. For me, the work started in 1975. Um, the reason I went to Poland last April was because of what I started in 1975, which was going to Poland then. I was a student of photography, 
and doing a project on what was what, what I could find on Polish Jewry, what was left. Uh, 1968 was the last major wave of immigration um, due to an anti-Semitic pur governmental purge. Um, so what was left really were older people, pensioners, um, people who aren't going anywhere. It was, it was globally understood that when this generation died out, it was the end of a thousand year history of Polish Jewish life and culture. Uh, initially, it was going to be a one-off. I was there in 1975 to do this project with a writer. It became a book in 1977. But three and a half years after my first visit in 75, I was back as a working professional photographer uh, doing actually world events, uh, what could be considered magazine photojournalism. But on my own, privately, very privately, uh, I, and without any fanfare, I sought out the Jewish community where people had already started to know me. Uh, I had given pictures to them on, 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 sub on trips, subsequent trips. So, some of them knew me, some people knew me and they recognized me. Uh, and I was allowed, uh, sometimes easier said than done, to photograph in what might have been considered sensitive situations. Uh, that was from 78 to 83. I then did not go back to Poland until 2013, which is what this picture is. Um, this is in 2013, 30 years after my had then last visit. Uh, and this is Rabbi Avi Bomo on the extreme right in his very first Sunday school class at JCC Krakow, introducing a Torah to, uh, to new generations of Jews. Uh, so from 2013 uh, to this very, to the present day, I've been going back and forth to photograph this regeneration, this revival, this return to identity, there's various names for it. Um, but it's quite real of, of people who have found out or still finding out about their Jewish roots. Uh, grandfather, grandmother, different sides of the families, um, hidden, hidden for decades. Uh, quick story for this picture, which is uh, just a typical kind of a story. The young man in the middle uh, at the time. Uh, he was 22 years old when I made this picture. Four years earlier, on his 18th birthday, his mother gave him a little box, just a little tiny box, uh, and said, this is from my mother, your grandmother, who was no longer alive. And she said, this is for this young man. Um, give it to him on his 18th birthday. Don't open it up. Do not open it up. The mother, his mother listens to her mother and uh, puts it away, and when he turns 18, gives him the box. And he said, well, what is this? She said, I don't know, it's from grandma. Uh, of course, he said it in Polish. Uh, but so he opened up the box, and inside is a Star of David, a gold Star of David, and on the back is the words to Damien from love grandma and grandpa. He looks at it and, and says to his mother, what's this? And she said, I don't know. Halachically, <laughs> Damien, the, the young man, and his mother were Jewish. It was a secret. It, was been, it had been buried for decades. Um, people did that. Many people did that uh, to protect the younger generations. Uh, well, this young man then wanted to know what, what is it to be a Jew? Uh, and this is in crack of this particular picture. At the time, he was able to go to what was then a JCC. And, and find out, like other people his age, what it was all about and slowly started to learn. This is at um, the yearly Jewish cultural festival takes place in Krakow, uh, where um, people from all over the world come in, um, Jews and non-Jews, Poles, international group, and uh, and it's uh, like ten days of learning and uh, and education and and music and this was the last night called Shal Shalom and Shiroka. Um, it's real. It, it's happening. The last time I was in Poland before last April was in 2019 to photograph the Ride for the Living, 
uh, among other things, but one of the things was the Right for the Living, which what Jonathan mentioned, this JCC Crack of uh, sponsored ride uh, from Birkenau, from the gates of Birkenau to JCC uh, Krakow, and uh, it's to raise money um, for what what initially was to raise money for JCC Krakow. This year, it was used to it was, and this year I was back again, and um, it was the first ride um, uh, in person ride, but this year's money was used to, strictly for Ukrainian refugee relief. And now, now we're here. This is last April. This is the gate of the JCC, JCC Krakow. In Ukrainian, that sign says welcome. Um, and what you see, obviously, are women and, and a baby, because that's primarily, not exclusively, but primarily the people who go through those gates, uh, who, who get, who, who, uh, get necessary supplies, uh, they get essentials. This is a typical day last April, upwards at the time, upwards of 600 people, 600 Ukrainian refugees, or we'll call them displaced Ukrainians, uh, were waiting on lines to get access to the free distribution center inside where they could get, pick up almost anything, uh, sanitary supplies, medicine, food, clothes, shoes, um, you name it. And it was uh, all through donations, um, money raised that JCC Cracker could then buy supplies, bulk supplies. Um, this particular woman is waiting by the front door. Her name is Olga. Uh, I'll fill out some names because these are real people. You know, these are real people who just, were in a very unusual circumstance, totally beyond their control. Uh, this is a family from Mikolaev. Uh, Mikolaev. Um, they're outside the front door, but they're, they're underneath an awning because it's raining. There are people, you know, waiting in the rain, uh, and but they're waiting their turn to go inside. This is seen from the front door of the JCC. People patiently wait. Uh, cell phones, mobile devices, uh, it's, you know, yes, these women are refugees, these people are refugees, but, you know, you're not in Sudan, you're not in, uh, you know, a third world country. This is, these are, you know, primarily middle class people, everyday people. These are everyday people um, from teachers to, to lawyers to, to, to doctors to, to moms, you know, you know grandparents. Everyday people, they're communicating, they're trying to find out, they help each other. Uh, and this is their way to help help each other find situations, find uh, other resources. Uh, this particular this woman was at the end of the line. This is uh this is on the street itself. This is before, you know, before the uh this is the end of the line. You know, there's still a line snaking through the courtyard inside. Uh, and this, this woman's name was Marta, and she was from Lviv with her smartphone. Again, typical day, cold, dreary day in April, waiting online. Um, there's no fuss. It's just people waiting. Uh, this woman, this woman's name was Catherine. Um, she spoke English. I, I spoke with her um, a bit. Uh, that is her daughter, Julia, who was eight years old. Catherine was a kindergarten teacher in, uh, in Kharkiv. Um, she had uh, another child, 12 years old. She was staying at a friend's apartment in Krakow. This is literally, literally at the gate of JCC Krakow when, when they're online. Um, she, she was stuck. You know, she was in a, a bad situation. Uh, Speaking English, uh, her mom stayed stayed in Kharkiv, uh, and uh, and she told me that she this was in April. She said, "I think we must stay in Krakow until May." That was a while ago. Uh, this is at the front door, JCC Krakow, waiting. They're waiting patiently. Passports are checked. You have to have come in after February twenty fourth, after the Russian invasion, uh, and you need to show your passport and get checked off 
uh, people are waiting. Again, primarily women and children. Um, Jonathan mentioned bulk food before. This is this is food comes in bulk. Uh, it's bought again from donations uh, from all over the world, uh, from Jewish organizations, from individuals, everything. Um, this woman and her baby. Uh, this is Maria and her daughter Sophia, um, and they are from Jitomir. Uh, they have another place. People are, are holding their place, her place in line, while she's playing with the baby on, you know, outside. Uh, that's the. This is a typical scene. This is not unusual. This happens seven days a week. This is a very happy family uh, from Kiev. Uh, if they had just come out of the free distribution center, um, sometimes just called free shop. Uh, and if you see, and this was in April, this was around Passover time. If you see the box she's holding, it's a it's a used uh, an empty matzo box that she they, they will be used to take stuff take stuff home with. Um, and they were very happy to uh, have been there. Three kids, three Ukrainian kids playing with yo-yos that they just gotten from inside the uh, distribution center. Uh, this little six-year-old girl is hugging her stuffed animal while her mother um, wait, and other family members wait online, uh, well, off, but off camera. This is all in the courtyard of JCC. Crackle. Uh, people are waiting online, but kids play. You know, um, there's a blackboard. It's uh, some you know written in Ukrainian. Glory to Ukraine. Um, we now move into the springtime. I was there first in April, and then again June and July. Um, and this young boy is actually seeking advice from his mother, and they are they are from Kamenets Podolsky in Ukraine. This is before the gate actually opened in the in the, you know summer morning. Um, as you can see, older women. It was cold in April. It was hot in July. Front door. Passports in hand. Uh, not only money. Uh, you know, it was sent in, it's sent into JCC Krakow, but Jewish communities from around the world have been sending in, as you can see here, over the counter medicines, food, I mean, uh, uh, clothing, sometimes food, um, but actually it's easier just to send money because JCC Krakow can buy the food bulk. Uh, and, but this is, this is in the JCC Krakow warehouse uh, around the corner from the JCC where there's items waited to be to be unpacked. Uh, this is the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue group um, uh, that visited last April. It's Jonathan in the in the middle. Uh, they brought over 80 duffel bags uh, filled with everything, you know, clothing, shoes, toys, meds, you name it. Um, Almost all of it was staying here to go inside the distribution center. Some of it they were going to be taking to the humanitarian aid center in Shemesh uh, for other Ukrainian refugees first coming in. And they were on a fact finding. They were basically they were on a fact finding mission. Uh, international volunteers were mentioned before. Here's some of them. Um, there's your, there's a line of refugees. Here's bulk items being individualized. You know, you want people to be able to take something, but not something that, that's enough for 10 people. So things have to get broken down. And here are the same thing, getting broken down into smaller personalized baggies. Over-the-counter medicines, um, Ukrainian women trying to discern what it is that they're holding. 
because it's not in Ukrainian uh, and it's not in Polish. Not that they would understand Polish either because Polish, English and Ukrainian are three different languages. Well, there's Ukrainian speaking volunteers within this redistribution center that, that help them. Little baby with her mother, mother's getting clothing for the baby. Helping hands, you know, putting stuff together. Uh, the, the free distribution center is never crowded. That's why there's a line out through the courtyard because people, they don't want to, people, it's the feeling that you're shopping, you're getting things, you're not, you're not rubbing, you're not trying to, um, uh, it's not an overcrowded situation. So there's a certain amount of people allowed in per, you know, at a time. And as people exit, you know, someone else comes in. It was mentioned that 98% of approximately 98% of the of the people, uh, Ukrainians are not Jewish. Well, this is a woman examining um, something she probably had never seen before, these very large crackers. It's also known as matzah. Uh, again, this was during Passover time. Shoes. Uh, if some people had to leave in a hurry, some people, and you can only take as much as you can carry, Shoes take up room. Uh, shoes, clothing. This is these these pictures are all done inside the free distribution center. Empty shelves. I mean, they're stocked. You know, they're constantly restocked and restocked. But people need. This woman is asking help in Ukrainian from a Ukrainian speaking um, uh, volunteer. Woman on the left, also a uh, Ukrainian a refugee herself, helping out fellow refugees. And what she's doing here is uh, dispensing uh, medicine, uh, probably vitamins, so that people can actually take what they need. All inside the distribution center. Obviously indicating she needed more than one. This is the just outside the free distribution center. This uh, young young mom uh, was tending to her her baby after coming out. Uh, this is a family. Um, his name is uh, Yako. Uh, that's his daughter-in-law and his granddaughter uh, that he's holding on to, and his wife is in the background. They're, um, uh, they're, well, he's Jewish uh, from, from Ukraine, uh, from uh, uh, Basil, Basil, Kahn, Basil Keith, sorry. Uh, and um, this is in the hotel room. They have adjoining rooms uh, that JCC Krakow is paying for. Um, it was mentioned, Jonathan mentioned that uh, hotel rooms are, uh, uh, many hotel rooms and apartments are subsidized or paid for by JCC Krakow. And this is one family who, who is uh, receiving that benefit. And this, here's Yaakov during the Ukrainian Seder, uh, Ukrainian Seder uh, at, at JCC Krakow. There's, they, um, they held six different Seders. This was the Ukrainian Seder. This is during the Ukrainian Seder. On her, on this woman's wrist, um, side of her hand, is written the word victorious. A 
Ukrainian server. In April was also the Orthodox uh, Easter, uh, Ukrainian Easter. Uh, JCC Krakow had uh, an Orthodox Easter party, and this was there. And again, there's, uh, it was mentioned before, but there is no differentiation whether you're Jewish, not Jewish, whatever. You're a refugee, you're helped. This was during that time, during that Easter party. This is the this is called Vitalnia, which is a, a daycare center, also considered a safe space uh, for moms and Ukrainian and, and kids uh, or Ukrainian refugees. Uh, this woman is Polina. She actually works there, but she does have a daughter in, staying there. Uh, Vitalnia was organized, supported, um, funded by JCC Cracker, and. Uh, it's Vitalia, Vitalia means living room in English. Um, besides the daycare center and safe space, they also have um, art therapy classes, uh, Polish language classes uh, for, for uh, people to learn Polish so that they can get a job. People, a lot of people want jobs, need jobs to sustain themselves. This is nap time in Vitalnia. This woman's name is Dasha. Um, this is also nap time in Vitalnia. Uh, Dasha was um, in Ukraine, um, took care of, of children, that, and she continues doing that here as well. This is now, uh, we're still in Krakow, but this is uh, a facility known as, by its street address. The street address is Radza Velovska. Um, it's a shelter, it's an information hub. Uh, it's where, uh, it's often a first stop where people who first get to Krakow might end up or might go to for information, for help, and to help find a place to stay. This shelter is upstairs. It was a former theater. Um, now there's 80 mattresses on the floor for, um, for women and children. Men have a separate area down below, uh, on the floor below. Uh, this woman, uh, she was on her way. Uh, she had been there for one night. She was leaving the next morning. Um, Usually people stay in this place one or two nights only. Similar to this woman who is a computer programmer, um, she was on her way to the Netherlands where she thought she would have a job there. Her name was Oksana. This is Marina with her one-year-old. Um, she had three children uh, and uh, they were all there with her as well as her mother uh, and her husband. Her husband was allowed to leave. Oh, most men, you, the reason you don't see many men in, in this is because uh, men between the ages of 18 to 60 uh, are not allowed to leave Ukraine. Uh, primarily, they uh, are military age, they help, they help the economy, they do whatever they can if they're not in the army. Uh, unless you have a, a medical uh, disability or leave, then you allow, uh, or you have three children, then you're allowed to leave. This I learned from her husband who was with her, who spoke in English. This is Victoria. Uh, after having breakfast, uh, um, an outdoor breakfast uh, at the hotel that she and her uh, daughter Alice were staying in, which is the same hotel that I was staying in. 
Um, it's in Casimir's, which is in, in Krakow. Uh, she was expressing, um, and she was staying there. Let me, oh, let me preface. She was staying there for free. Uh, she was staying there at no charge, thanks to JCC, thanks to JCC Krakow. They were paying her hotel room. Um, she was, I'm going to read what she wrote. I, I wrote down what she said. She was expressing at the time with an open heart that she couldn't imagine breakfast in Casimir's from Kharkiv to here, from darkness to light. We are very thankful. She told me that an American volunteer had literally, had literally driven them from Kharkiv directly to Krakow. Uh, she said that when they were one meter over the border inside Poland, she began to lose her fear. Again, she then further said, we're safe now. That's all we need. This is her daughter. This is Alice or Alisa uh, with her pet guinea pig in the hallway of the hotel. Um, many people took pets with them, their pets. This is Victoria and Alisa um, actually looking up at the trumpeter in Krakow at St. Mary's. Um, uh, church, which is an hourly occurrence, a live trumpet. This is Elisa in art therapy. You mentioned art therapy. This is Vitalia, uh, art therapy class. Also, Vitalia, this is a Polish language class, but um, this, this woman's uh, son needed some attention. Romani people, Roma, um, once known and still by many as gypsies. Um, at, the, at this point in time, about uh, 100, at, this was last April, about 130 uh, Roma people were being housed in this, in a hostel, a hotel in Krakow. Um, JCC Krakow were providing their food. And these pictures were made in the, um, the cafeteria dining room. Uh, they like to express their opinions. They are very warm people. Um, uh, and outgoing. Three generations, mother, daughter, grandma, making food. Jonathan mentioned a palace um, uh, 25 kilometers outside of, of uh, Krakow. This is Pashkovka Palace. Uh, this particular picture was made during the very first meeting between JCC personnel and um, Ukrainian refugees who were going to be housed there. Uh, um, and there's upwards of about 80, 80 families, 80 people staying there, they're um, the palace is maintained, supported by uh, JCC Krakow, by contributions, of course. And um, these people are considered more well off compared to someone obviously staying in the shelter. Peshkovka offers, um, that's the palace itself. That's Helenorchka in the foreground, um, clasping her, her, her chest with her, one of her daughters behind her. Uh, Helenorchka in a balcony of her room, which was across from the palace itself, where people were being housed at that time. Now they're in the palace, now they're back in, now they're in the palace, um, hanging clothes to dry. Uh, on the bed with her youngest daughter. She shared that bed with uh, three girls. This is a few, this is a young woman we just saw a few pictures back. This is now three months later. She's learning Polish in Pashkovka Palace. Pashkovka, this is little Diana. Um, a Zumba class, a Zumba dance class. Back to JCC Krakow Courtyard. 
it's a safe place to be. If people congregate there, they eat their lunch, their free lunch there. They, you know, they they stay there. It's it's a place where people can feel safe. This is a uh, woman on the right. Her name is Nasia. That's her mother, Victoria. Um, they're uh, both Ukrainian refugees. Uh, Nastya works now for JCC Krakow. Um, this was made a few days after her mother and father arrived in Krakow. Uh, and it's literally, it's during their first walk around the city. By chance, they came up, upon, upon this, this plaque on the wall commemorating the Hol Holodomor, Holodomor um, which for those not familiar, was the um, Stalin Soviet communist regime uh, imposed famine on Ukraine in 1932, 1933, where about 4 million Ukrainians died from starvation. Um, uh, they're both from Nikolaev. Uh, with Victoria uh, having Armenian descent as well, and they're also Jewish, uh this was they've survived now if, if you include the current russian invasion their family has survived uh let's see, the armenian genocide the holocaust um uh well the, the holodomor and now the russian invasion this is vasilisa with grandma victoria um vasilisa Nastya's daughter getting her hair braided in, in Nastya's apartment where they all stay. Nastya and Vasilisa on their way to JCC Krakow, passing another Ukrainian family waiting outside an apartment with all of their belongings, uh, waiting to, to have, get access to an apartment. Vasilisa attends uh, Friday kindergarten, JCC uh, kindergarten, and um, Nastya's on her way to work. Vasilisa had Frida telling a secret to a friend in the kindergarten. These are Nastya's parents who now volunteer at the free distribution center, Victor and Victoria. This is a, a different facility. This is called Shafa Dobra, which in English means closet of good. Um, it's uh, an organization um, that that has, has taken over what was once a uh, an empty an empty shopping area uh, in a mall, and um, free, and distribute uh, clothing um, clothing as if it were a, a department store for free to Ukrainian refugees. Um, these girls uh, and 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 the girl's mom on the left uh, were FaceTiming to uh, relatives back in Ukraine. But they were playing, you know, they had toys, they got panda bears, put them on their heads. Uh, again, this is just like any any kind of uh, department store. Everything is, is, is nicely, you know, put on racks and people can choose. Mom with her son, getting new shoes. This is all in Shafa Dobra. Uh, I should mention that uh, JCC Crack of partnered with Shafa Dobra, as well as in Radzo, Radza Velovska, which was that temporary shelter and information hub. Uh, trying on a bra, the, way, the only way possible. This is lunchtime at a, a hostel summer camp sponsored by JCC Krakow. Um, these are the first kids there. A couple hours later, uh, other kids uh, at uh, local at the local beach, um, Ukrainian refugee kids at summer camp paid for by JCC Club. Playroom of that summer camp. 
This is a quick trip up, quick trip up to Warsaw. Um, items came in from all over the world to Krakow, to Warsaw, to various places. And Warsaw also had free shops. And this uh, was a Ukrainian family, uh, mother, daughter on the right side, um, who had visited for the first time and got a lot of clothing. This is the border of Medica. Um, this is the Polish-Ukrainian border where many uh, people, many people uh, came, came through, still coming through uh, on foot. Uh, this, uh, NG, various NGOs um, had set up tents. JCC Krakow had a presence there. Um, uh, they're on their way. This is literally the moment, just, Moments ago, they had just come in, just come in the border, come through the border. Usually, their first stop was is then here at the humanitarian aid center in Shemesh. Um, these young girls are showing their passports; they're getting registered um, to then have access to then be within the humanitarian aid center, where they can shelter, where they can get. Food uh, and information, and and possibly move, and then move on to other places within Poland or 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 Europe or anywhere. This is a hallway. This is a corridor in the humanitarian aid center. Um, it was um, for movie buffs. It was a very Fellini esque uh, experience being in corridors in this in this place. Uh, it's run by the Polish government. It was established by the Polish government. Uh, maintained by the Polish military and police and NGOs uh, from all over are there to help. Um, JCC Krakow was partnering with a, still partnering with an evangelical Christian organization that did a lot of work here, as well as in Medica, as well as, and also in Ukraine. This, this 12 year old girl was traveling with her mother and brother. Uh, and this is in a, a shelter room within the humanitarian aid center. They were leaving the next morning. Um, they were leaving the country. They were uh, hoping to go, um, to go to the Czech Republic. In the humanitarian in the humanitarian aid center, Hadassa Medical um, Hadassa, Hadassa International set up a medical clinic um, to help people. Hadassah, uh, medical in the inside. Uh, this, their, their clinic was actually located within a former motorcycle shop. Um, this humanitarian aid center used to what was a shopping mall, was a huge shopping mall. Back on the border of Medica, um, these are uh, international team of riders. Uh, this is now um, this past uh, late June, early July. Uh, this was this year's Ride for the Living, JCC Krakow sponsored Ride for the Living. Um, this team from Israel, Poland, um, uh, Ukraine are facing Ukrainian uh, facing Ukraine before they turn around and then uh, ride to uh, to uh, Auschwitz Birkenau, and then the next day joining everyone else to ride from Birkenau to JCC Krakow. This is Vasilisa again with her mom, Nastya. This is at Shabbat dinner in July. Uh, JCC Crack of Shabbat dinner uh, takes place during the Jewish Cultural Festival after the Ride for the Living. Both, and as an aside, Nastya with her daughter and parents uh, have decided that they uh, make, they're making Crack of their permanent home. First of all, uh, Chuck, thank you. And thank you for the audience that stayed because I asked people to stay. Some apologized and had to leave, but that's fine. I want to go back to um, what actually Judith said at the very, very beginning uh, that uh, we're talking about uh, humanity, uh, uh, humanitarian acts. And I think we just we're trying to close a circle that I guess can never be closed. Um, taking uh, the situation of Jewish refugees in Ukraine after the war and going full circle almost 
to what is happening today in Krakow with uh, the youth refugees from Ukraine. Um, I have to say that the, after a very graphic and difficult presentation from Marta, we maybe can have uh, this closer look to the stories of the women that you brought and through the stories of the women, the children, the families that Chuck brought. And in between, we have Jonathan doing all this uh, amazing work uh, to help the, the refugees. I think more than anything, both of you were able to bring real people with real experiences and take us away from the millions and millions that we always hear and to put a face and a name and a story uh, so that we can listen and we can learn. And maybe, maybe, just like Jonathan asked, maybe we can get to some sort of uh, tikkun olam. This is what we're looking at this week. We started today, we're gonna to continue tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, I wanna thank all our amazing guests and of course our audience that uh, shared this journey with us together. It was a privilege and an honor to have you all with us today. And uh, we will continue to, uh, to, to look at, investigate and try to understand what's happening today in our world. Toda Rabba to everyone. And of course, to our wonderful partners at Friedrich Irbert, I can't forget to say that as well. Thank you for helping make, make, make this evening come, come about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madin, for organizing this wonderful event. Thank you, Chuck and others, for their work. It's incredible. It's really yeah. incredible. Yeah, and you know, today's presentation, um, your work actually reminds us one of the greatest lessons from the Holocaust, not to be uh, bystanders, but to be upstanders. Absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely agree. Not to show indifference, you know, not, not to turn your blo not to turn away, you know, from turn away. Right. Yeah. Thank you absolutely. so much.